You're listening to the First Baptist Rockdale Sunday Sermons Podcast. First Baptist Rockdale is a church dedicated to making disciples who make disciples. We hope you enjoy this week's message. We're continuing our path through the beginning of John. Today is actually our final sermon in the book of John that we'll be doing uh, in this series. So we're in John chapter 11. If you have your Bible, you can open up to John chapter 11. And what we've been dealing with is Jesus has been, um, you know, revealing who he is, um, slowly revealing pieces of who he is, kind of explicitly stating last week um, that he and the Father are one. So this is like united um, entity that, that, that Jesus is with God the Father. Um, and all along the way, he's developing followers, he's developing opponents, Um, And now he's setting his eyes towards Jerusalem. Jesus' final great act um, is going to take place in the great city of Jerusalem. And so his eyes are set there. There are people who want to kill him uh, in Jerusalem. There are leaders who want to arrest him and execute him um, for blasphemy or really just for upsetting their um, understanding of how God is. And so Jesus' eyes get set towards Jerusalem uh, and he's about to head that way. And out on the way there, uh, we run into what is probably um, the most powerful miracle Jesus does uh, as, as uh, before the resurrection. Right? This is the miracle that it, it kind of stands out. You're like, whoa, that is real power. And that's, and that's the raising of Lazarus, Jesus' dear friend. We're going to do all of chapter 11 today. And so I'm going to do some summarizing um, to help us get Uh, to where I want us to actually see uh, specifically uh, what God is saying to us in this passage. Um, But the story begins in in John chapter 11 um, with Jesus uh, staying um, a little ways away from where Lazarus is in Bethany. Uh, It's a four-day journey from where he is to where Lazarus is. And some people come to him and say, Hey, um, Lazarus, your friend, the one you love, is uh, sick almost to the point of death. Right? And Jesus, um, being Jesus, having omniscience, the ability to know all things at all times, um, kind of looks at the situation and says, I need to go to Bethany. He tarries two days to continue the ministry he's doing where he is. Um, and then he goes to Bethany on his way, or right before he goes, his disciples pause him and say, hey, Jesus, you know, Bethany is like, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like Minerva to Rockdale, okay? It's right there. I mean, it's just outside of town of Jerusalem. He said, you know, if we go into Jerusalem, if we go to Bethany right by Jerusalem, there are going to be people there who are going to find out that you're there, and they're going to find you, they're going to arrest you, uh, and then we're going to have a mess on our hands. Are you sure you want to go? And Jesus says, yes, I, I need to go. To Bethany, I need to go and wake Lazarus up. And they said, look, well, if he's sleeping, that's great, right? If he's asleep, that's a wonderful thing. He's like, no, he's not sleeping, right? He's dead, but I'm going to bring him back. And they're like, this is weird. We're not sure what to do. And then in verse 17, uh, we pick up and it says, now when Jesus came to into Bethany or just outside of Bethany, uh, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Um, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and she met him. But Mary remained seated in the house, and Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha replied, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And Martha said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Okay, so Jesus is on his way. He's just outside of town. Martha comes and meets him. Lazarus' sister comes and meets him and says, Look, 
he wouldn't have died if you were here. And this isn't an accusation. Sometimes we read it like an accusation. Like, if you had been there, this wouldn't have happened. She's not shaking his finger at him. She's really just expressing faith in the fact that she knows who Jesus is. She's like, I know that if you were here, right, Lazarus, he wouldn't have died. Because you can heal anyone from anything. It's really just testimony to her faith that Jesus could have healed Lazarus had he been present. Uh, Truthfully, Jesus could have healed Lazarus from where he stood miles and miles away. Jesus did it on multiple occasions, distance healings. We read about them uh, in different parts of the Bible. Uh, One, there was a a little girl who was sick, and Jesus says, uh, go, your faith uh, has made her well, right? I've never seen such faith in all of Israel as I see in this person here. Uh, And then uh, the little girl is made well, centurion's uh, daughter or son, servant, centurion's servant has the same sort of miracle take place where Jesus heals over distance. Distance is not a barrier for Jesus to work. Martha just recognized that Jesus has the power to heal. And Jesus wants her to see that he has more than that power. You know, sometimes we box Jesus in, and this, I'm, I'm guilty of this. We like to box God into something that's, that's safe for us to carry around, right? Something that, that we can sort of understand, like it's like Matt plus, like that's what God is. He's like, Matt, the very best version of who I am, plus a little bit extra, right? Just a little bit extra that makes him just better than me, just a little more powerful than me, just a little more, you know, God-like than me. You know, but, but generally, we like God to fit close to us. We like to box him in and make him something that we can kind of grab our hands on. And we know we can't control him, but we can kind of grapple with the concept of who he is. But God is not, you know, you plus a little bit of better than you. Right? He isn't something that you can even really grab a hold of and feel like you have any control over you know i watch uh rodeo rarely because i'm not that person but my favorite thing to watch is bull riding i love bull riding because you got this bull that they've made like mad for some reason i don't know why they made the bull mad or they made this bull like as angry as possible and a dude says yeah i'm gonna jump on this thing and let's see what happens right And, and so and they see what happens and oftentimes what happens is a comedy of destruction of a person, right? They go flying up in the air and landing on their backs. And and the whole goal is for eight seconds to hold on to that beast while it's hopping around like a maniac. That's the whole goal. Can I get eight seconds? And I don't know how they score it, by the way. I have no idea what, what, how you score bull running. I think it should be a completion grade. Like you completed it, good job. And everyone who doesn't complete it gets kicked out. You just kind of tournament wise until someone can't complete it anymore. Right, but apparently, I guess the bull, if it's harder to ride or your head is still, I don't know. I don't understand gymnastics scoring either. And it's weird that those scoring seem to be the same to me, right? That gymnastics scoring and bull riding scoring are basically the same people doing it, right? Some East German judge is over there like four, right? How'd that, how'd that happen, right? Right, I don't understand. But, but, but I love bull riding because you got this dude and he holds on to this beast. And if he can hold on to it for eight seconds, he feels like a champion and and sometimes i think like god is like that except so much more violently like uncontrollable and we like to think that we can just grab onto him and just like hitch a ride like he's a domesticated horse like he'll go where we want him to go and the truth is god is in control of where he goes Right, God is so much more powerful than we like to think. We, he's not the boxed-in, safe, domesticated version that you see. He's the angry bull, right, that's been caged up, which we wouldn't even be able to be caged up, that if you dare to hop on, you're never making it half a second. He is uncontrollable. He is massive, and he is powerful. And Martha comes out there and says, I know you could have healed him, Jesus, because Jesus, I've seen it. You're like man plus healer. You're, you're like this, 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 this man who can also do healings. It's an amazing thing that you have. You're, you're this plus that. And I know you could do it. I know you could do it. And Jesus wants her to see, like, I'm not, I'm not just that. But I'm not just like a, a, a really, really skilled doctor. Like, I can bring the dead 
to life. And in fact, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus says that, that, that life comes through him and those people who believe in him never die. Right? He says like that your picture of me, your domesticated picture of me isn't right. And I think as a church, we need to grab a hold of that picture just for a second. To see that what you think about God, how you understand God, right? He is not your tame figure. He's not some tame deity that you're in control. My kids are in a play right now, Aladdin. Right? And a lot of us think God is Aladdin's lamp, right? We, we rub the lamp, the genie comes out, we're Aladdin. We say, God, now that I've got you under my control, I'll ask you to do these things because I know you have power to do whatever it is that I ask you to do. And then when he's done granting the wish or we pray or whatever, we put him back in the lamp, we throw him in our pocket, we carry him around because we control him. And that is so far from the truth. Right? He is the, he's the wild bull, right? And if you try to get on and take him for a ride, you're going to go places that you never intended to be. And you're going to end up in a position that you probably don't want to be. Right? And so, so what I'm trying to get you to understand is God is bigger and stronger and less predictable than you think that he is. Right? I'm not, he's not vicious and vengeful. Right? We have a good understanding of what God can be from Scripture, but he's bigger than your mind can grab onto. God is, so Jesus is trying to draw that out for Martha for her to see, like, I'm not just a healer. Like, I am, I am life. Like, I am life itself. Standing in front of you is life. Without me, there's no life. How crazy is that? Right, to fathom in your mind for a second that embodied in the person of Jesus Christ is life. The idea that, that there is a sun and that this universe is spinning and that things can live inside of this universe that we live in, Jesus is the embodiment of why that is possible to happen. He is not your tame God, stop trying to box him in to what you have. And so Martha, Martha is like, look, I believe you are exactly who you say you are. And that's kind of where we end up as Christians. Like, like I don't want to try to grab onto, onto everything that you are, God. I'm just going to believe that you are who you say you are. And so Martha continues, uh, uh, or continues on, verse 28. She had said this. She went and she called her sister Mary, verse 28, uh, and saying in private, look, the teacher... Uh, is here and he's calling for us. So, so, um, and when she heard it, Mar Mary rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus hadn't yet come into the village, but was still standing where he was uh, when he met Martha. In verse 31, when the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and she saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Same thing. Her sister said, and when Jesus saw her weeping and saw the Jews um, who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and he was greatly troubled. And he said to them, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man how so have kept this man from dying. One thing that I love about my picture of God is that I can include this inside of my picture of God. Right? Like I, I just painted God as this like unpredictable bull, right? That we, we have no business trying to grab onto and totally domesticate. But that same God that is all powerful and has like attributes that are that, that are unfathomable to our minds, that same God stood in the flesh and wept alongside of those who grieved. Right? I love that picture of Jesus. See, because God didn't just stay far away, and he isn't just some uncontrollable force. He's also near to those who grieve. You know, Jesus cares for you. He cares for people. People matter to Jesus. I went and lectured to the, Sunday, the, the youth Sunday school class today about how Jesus cares for for people. He does. He cares about people. And that means when you hurt, right, he, he has the ability to, to hurt alongside of you. Sometimes we just need to know that. That God draws near to us in our sorrows, 
the same God who has the power to prevent the sorrows that we, that we find ourselves in draws near to us in our sorrows to walk with us through them. Some of you this year, this past 18 months, this COVID period in your life has been terribly difficult. You've had a series of rough situations. You may have had your own health complications, uh, friends going through things, right? All of us have been touched by the virus in one way or another, right? Someone somewhere around us has dealt with it. Um, to varying degrees, we've lost church members um, from, from, from coronavirus. Right? Like it's a real troubling time that we find ourselves in. And you may stand here uh, today and just be a little broken. I want you to know if you're broken today, it's okay. Jesus sees you where you are, and he can, he can sit with you. Even knowing what he's going to do, because most of you know how the story ends, right? Jesus is going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Spoiler alert, five minutes in advance, okay? Like he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He knows what he's going to do. But in that moment, when grief is so great, Jesus sits alongside of them and grieves with them. I love that picture. It's also one of the shortest verses in Scripture. So if you're like, I'm no good at memorizing Scripture, you can memorize this one, right? John 11, 35, Jesus wept. Boom, check it off. Tell your friends, right? I memorized Scripture today, suckers, right? What'd you do in church? Nothing, right? I'm just saying, you can do it if you want to be that person. Maybe you want to be that person. It's John 11, 35, Jesus wept. Okay, I believe in you, church. I believe you can memorize that. I memorized it and put it on my list like when I was like, hey, I can... I've got five verses memorized. One of them was Jesus wept, okay? I'm just saying that was one of, one of the five, right? It was that, Genesis 1-1, John 3-16, uh, the beginning of the Romans road, eight, 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 right? 3-23, 6-23, kind of at the beginning of the Romans road. That was my first five, right? There's also a verse in Ezra, pretty sure Ezra, because um, I remember someone told me it's, it's that Jesus wept is the shortest verse in the Bible. This is free, by the way. It has nothing to do with the sermon. Um, but in the NIV, um, I was just going through my Bible, because you know what you do when the preacher's up there just talking for a while? I've been there, right? You just kind of just like, I got a big book in front of my eyes. I'm like, man, there's got to be something else in here better than listening to him for a little bit. Um, y'all would never do that because I'm captivating, but, but I've been there myself, okay? And so I was flipping through my Bible uh, as a teenager one time, and then like there was like a, a table in the NIV version. I, I have an ESV now that I, that I preach from, and I don't think the table is, is exactly the same way. Um, but in Ezra, I'm pretty sure it's Ezra, it's talking about these people came from here to help with this, to rebuild the temple or whatever was going on in Ezra. Um, and there was a verse, and all the verse said was, of Nebo 27, with the number 27. And I was like counting up the characters, like, hey, that's shorter, right? That's pretty good. So, so maybe of Nebo 27. That doesn't seem as like theologically significant to me as a verse you can memorize, but if you want to add one more to your lexicon of things you can memorize, you can have Jesus wept John eleven thirty five, and then wherever of Nebo is in, in, your, in your NIV, okay? So that's, a, that's free of charge, okay? Um, you don't even have to put anything extra in the box when you leave for that, okay? That was just fully free for you today, okay? But Jesus uh, is this God who is the resurrection of life, this un, like, unmanageably, amazingly powerful God, but he's also a God who sits near to us because he cares for us even in the midst of our grief. If you're grieving today, I want you to know God sits with you in your grief, but he doesn't just stay there because God is a God who can solve impossible problems. The problem that is impossible is that Lazarus is dead, and Jesus says that problem isn't impossible for me. So verse 38, Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was laid against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone, and Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. I love the King James version of this. It say he stinketh. Right? That's the King James uh, for what is going on with Lazarus. There, some of you got your King James out. You're like, yes, it does say he stinketh. Right? That's a, that's a, that's a pretty good use of uh, like advanced Shakespearean style English to use the word stinketh in the Bible to describe the rotting corpse of Lazarus, right? But Lazarus has been in the grave for four days. Four days in, things don't smell so great. Some of you had like a possum or a raccoon or a rat die somewhere near you, and you're like, yeah, after a couple days, it, it gets real ripe. And you think you're just going to wait it out, right? Like maybe the smell will go away, but it gets in the wall and it stays forever, right? Now that's, again, free for you. Okay, Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believe, this verse 40, if you believed, you would see the glory of God. 
So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes, and he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this on the account of all the people standing around that they can believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the man who had died for four days came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. What a powerful miracle. Uh, sort of the resurrection of Jesus Christ where he raised himself from the dead. The most impressive miracle on my accounting that Jesus ever did. Goes to a cave of someone who is long since dead. This is not a resuscitation. This isn't you come in afterwards, you pound on the chest a few times and get the old ticker going again. This is a man who stinketh in the grave. And Jesus walks up and says, come out. And Lazarus immediately comes out. Right, what, a, what, a, what a crazy display of that power, that power that Jesus tried to get Martha to grab on at the beginning of this, this passage, he shows it right there. And in that moment, all of our eyes should open up and be like, oh, he's bigger than I think. Because we, we don't think that, right? We, we still, like when we have big problems in our lives, we still go to ourselves for solutions. We still dive deep into ourselves or into our peers for solutions. And then at the end of ourselves, when we run out of ourselves, we say, well, I guess all we can do now is pray, which is basically surrender. Right? That's what we feel when we say, well, I guess all we can do is pray now. I, I mean, tried everything else. I guess we'll ask God. This is the same God who brings a, a long dead man back to life, and then we say, like, as a throwaway, well, maybe we'll pray now. I, I'd like to encourage you to flip that a little bit in your life. When you encounter a difficult situation, stop thinking, get on your knees and pray, right? Don't solve it, don't work solutions, don't manipulate the situation so that you can make something out of it. Stop, pray, then allow God to do what God can do, right? There, there's an opportunity for us to, 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 to just see the power of God display, but sometimes we're so busy avoiding that. We're so busy not wanting God to work because we want to work. Say, I'm going to solve this problem, and, and we refuse to access the one who can solve the problem. And that problem can be a financial problem. That problem can be a physical ailment. That problem can be a relational problem. But stop trying to solve them all. You're not that smart. The reason you have that problem is because you were involved in the first place. It's your problem. It's not God's problem. God didn't make that problem for you. You found that problem. Right? You found yourself in that situation. And then God jumps in. And if you'll allow him, God can do impossible absolutely impossible things. I read a story just, just yesterday. Uh, a child born 20-something weeks premature um, weighed less than a pound at birth. Zero percent chance of survival. Nine months later, doing great. Zero percent. The doctors come in and say, look, you have a child, but there's no chance of survival. I mean, imagine sitting like that as a parent. But the doctors come in, yes, you deliver the child, you know the child is premature, there is no chance for survival. I just want you to know, enjoy the, the, the day or the two days or the week that you may have with your little one, because those days are going to end imminently. Right? And so what does that family do? They go to God. They call their friends to go to God. Nine months later, we have a child with a 0% chance of survival, Still hanging in, doing just fine. But what an amazing, miracle-working God we have. But sometimes we don't go there, right? We hear 0% chance of survival, and we say, how can I fix that? And so what we do is we get on Google, and we look up, how do I take a 0% chance of survival and turn it into a 1% chance of survival? And we find some doctor somewhere that crushes up essential oils and rubs them on your baby, because that's magic. I mean, some of you are essential oil people, and I, I understand that, sort of. Um, but 
it doesn't heal everything, okay? Your frankincense, uh, which, which I, I mean, the only time I heard about frankincense my whole life was in the Christmas story, and then all of a sudden, it was everywhere. It was everywhere. Like, 10 years ago, just all of a sudden, frankincense was discovered as the cure for every ailment in the world. Right, right, but you go online, you find the doctor tells you, you know, walk backwards and spin around in a circle and put this oil on it and, you know, stop this and do this and do that. We go through all the things and we think maybe that will solve the problem, but you're still running with your 0%. No, stop that. Go to the one who can do the unthinkably impossible thing. Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus comes out of the grave. There's a whole sermon to be made on the fact that Jesus unbound Lazarus said, take those grave clothes off and let him live a new life outside of those things. Some of you have been raised to new life. Right? We went to the baptistry once upon a time, buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life, and you never took off your grave clothes. You're still walking around in the same nonsense you were wearing when you went into the baptistry. Right? You still got the same sins, the same problems, the same issues. That's not today's sermon. I just want you to know if that's you today, Take that stuff off. There is life to be found outside of it. You're not called to live what you were before Jesus raised you to new life. Lazarus never put those clothes back on again, though I guess they were dressed on him again years later when he passed again. Continuing on, though, the story continues. It says, many of the Jews uh, who had come with him, verse 45 says, and had seen what he did, believed him. But some other ones went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Tattletales, these people. And so the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we going to do? For this man performs many signs. And if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and they will take away both our place and our nation. Their concern is that Jesus might be who he says he is. And if he is the Messiah, come to overthrow the Roman government. The Romans are going to hear about it. They're going to come in and they're going to take away the Jewish nation, the nation of Israel. Judea will be wiped from the face of the earth through the great power of the Roman Empire. And their position, they have some prominence because uh, Rome allowed them to have some prominence. Uh, and they said, and our position will be taken from us as well. And then the wise high priest maybe not at this time but will be uh, at another time Caiaphas speaks and he says in verse 49 you know nothing at all nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people not that the whole nation should perish he didn't say this of his own accord but being high priest that year he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and not only for the nation but also to gather uh, into one the children of God who are scattered, so that on that day, they, uh, so from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. Now, now guys, I want, I, want, I want to really sit here just for a minute. The, the chief priest looks at the situation, and the fear they have is that their position is going to be taken from them, and that their, their nation is going to be taken from them, not by Jesus, but by the Romans who get mad that Jesus becomes this Messiah king. And Caiaphas, who is not a believer in Jesus, has no faith in Jesus, says, Guys, I know what we need to do. We need to stop worrying about the Romans. We need to stop worrying about every, everyone and what they say about them. We need to kill Jesus. Because if we kill him, we save everyone. Right? If we kill him... The nation remains. And he says, and it's better for one man to die than for a whole nation to perish. And he doesn't know it, but he's absolutely right. That is the gospel message. It is better for one man to die than the entire world to perish. That's what Jesus did on the cross. One man died so that you and me and the entirety of creation would not perish. It's amazing how non-believers can speak such truth about, about God. Caiaphas didn't know that he was proclaiming redemption through Jesus Christ. 
he thought he was pragmatically saving his position and the position of those people who he loved on the high council and the Sanhedrin in that time period. But he's absolutely right. The greatest work that Jesus did isn't raising Lazarus from the dead. The greater work that Jesus did is exactly what Caiaphas pointed to. That he would die for the sins of the entire nation. Christ alone is that worthy sacrifice. That is the great part about Jesus Christ. That's the part that that should blow our minds open and think, oh my goodness, that he alone is a worthy sacrifice, that his great work is not miracles, it's not teachings, it's not wisdom that you can glean from him. His great work is being a capable, atoning sacrifice for your sins. Because see, your sins drive you to hell. It's what they do. That's where they take you. They drive you straight there. And Jesus intervenes on the way and says it's better for one to die for all than for all to die lost in their sin. And so Jesus died on the cross for your sin so that you could receive eternal life. And not just your sin, but my sin and the sin of the people on either side of you as well. Praise God that Jesus is a worthy sacrifice of atonement. He's bigger than the miracle of raising the dead to life because he raises those who are bound for perdition to glory forever. It is the great gift of God revealed in the face of Jesus Christ. That is the God that we serve. That is Jesus Christ. Jesus cares for you enough to do that which is utterly impossible not just miracles in your life today like the little child who with a zero percent chance of life who's now living happy healthy nine months later not that miracle alone but the miracle of taking you from death to life forever if you don't know that jesus today i want you to know him if you do know jesus as your lord and savior if you've already passed from death to life i want you to grab onto the earlier part of this message that God sent Christ to die on the cross to make a way for us, but also through that we have a relationship with God where we can go to God in prayer and ask Him for anything. And that doesn't mean you're going to get whatever you ask for, right? If I ask for a red Ferrari in my closing prayer here, it's unlikely when I go back to the parsonage that there will be one sitting in my driveway, though praise Jesus, right, if, if there is. But I think it's unlikely that that is the way God is going to work in this situation. Also, kind of an impractical car for a family of 52 or whatever I am right now. But, right, we can ask God for anything because he draws near to us. And as Christians, our lives should be categorized by prayer. Faith-filled prayer. Daily, you should be going to God praising him for who he is, and then confessing your sins, and then laying out what it is that God has placed on your heart that only God can solve, because you would get in the way if you tried to solve it. So that should be a daily routine for you. Oftentimes, multiple times a day. The Bible says pray without ceasing, right? And, I, and, I, and I'm there, right? I, there's times when I'm just walking around, I'm like, ooh, God, help me. Right? Like, I'm about to walk into a meeting. It's not a meeting I want to go into. Ooh, God, help me. I'm about to come home. Maybe I've crossed my wife a little bit, on, 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 and I can do that, by the way, um, from time to time. Right? I can find a way to go crosswise with Miss Higginbotham. And you know whose fault that is? Always mine. I think with almost no exception, it's almost always my fault. Um, but I, and I can, before I go through the door, before I go through the door, knowing what I'm walking in, I'm like, okay, God, help me not be an idiot. Right? And that's my prayer. Simple. Sweet, straight to the point. Because, like, if it's just me, I'm, I'm kind of an idiot, right? But God, because of the power of the Holy Spirit, sometimes right, right, God can intervene and shut my mouth before it opens and says something sweet. But we need to go to God in prayer. If you're, if you're a believer today, that prayer should categorize your life. Also, the idea that the God that you're praying to is bigger than the God that we like to keep in our pocket should transform the way you pray. Because instead of thinking, like, 
or these, you can call them loser prayers, that's not nice. These defeated prayers. God, I mean, I don't know if you can, if you might, if you would. I'd like this, but I'm not sure what, uh, you know, like these, like we, we make a lot of excuses for God. I, I say we. I can be guilty of making a lot of excuses for God in my prayer life. I'm going to try to give God an out over here and over here. So that, uh, right? Just pray faithfully. He's that, because uh, he is bigger, more powerful than you'll ever understand. Just pray faithfully. And let God do what God does. Because, like, you're not in control of many ways. So pray fervently, faithfully, because he cares for you. He wants to hear from you. He grieves when you grieve. He wants to do the impossible in your life. And if you're not a believer today, he wants to do the impossible now for you. And to take you from death 